Thank you, Sandy. Um, Your Excellency and Mrs. Doris, friends, family, uh, the uh, committee members of the Alumni uh, Association. Uh, let me higher. Okay. Let me um, start by saying what a privilege it is to be invited to be here with you this evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for. Uh, uh, giving me this privilege. Um, the topic, you know, is a, is a, is a very large one. Um, and, and, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because in my position, whenever I get a captive uh, audience, it's too much of a temptation not to convey um, some of the messages regarding uh, what is being done to strengthen this economy. Uh, because my um, basic thesis is going to be that uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative clearly presents a significant opportunity as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. But to take advantage uh, of that opportunity, uh, we need to stabilize our economy. Uh, we need to build a strong growth framework to absorb uh, what is possible, um, uh, what, will be, what will be possible in terms of uh, the opportunities that will be created by the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. And also, uh, if we are to uh, benefit, we need to uh, indulge in some astute diplomacy. Um, the, uh, a very senior ambassador in Colombo told me when I described uh, what I will be describing later in my um, talk about balancing different interests, he said, you mean you, you need to uh, be involved in, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, uh, strategic promiscuity. So that's, that's what we need to, uh, to have in our mind. So we need to be able to uh, balance various interests if we are to take advantage of it. So how I'm going to organize my remarks is first to uh, say why it's necessary to have stable macroeconomic policies, why it is necessary to have a strong growth framework if we are to benefit. Uh, from this initiative, then to outline the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, and to give the rationale behind it or attempt to do so, uh, and then uh, talk about uh, how uh, the initiative can be an opportunity as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, and, and some of the potential threats we would need to handle if we are to uh, uh, benefit, uh, to maximize the benefits. So what's being done to stabilize the economy? Um, of course, you know, in my position, I would say we are making progress. But I would say that we can be cautiously optimistic about the progress that is being made to stabilize the economy. If you look at the key indicators of stability in an economy on the domestic front, inflation is well within our 4 to 6% inflation target. Um, in uh, uh, April, uh, it had come down to 3.8%. Uh, 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 and uh, while we had a bit of a spike in inflation in the fourth quarter of last year, uh, it was almost entirely due to supply disruptions due to the weather. Uh, and the prices of food price inflation drove inflation up, the headline figure up. And it was, uh, again, largely due to two commodities, that was rice and coconuts. Uh, those two prices, which have a heavy weighting in the price index, uh, went up sharply and the overall headline inflation rate also went up close to 8%. But now that the supply uh, situation has st stabilized, uh, inflation has now come down well within the target a range of 4 to 6%. It will go up a little bit because of the increase in the administered price of fuel uh, and of gas um, uh, uh, and of milk food. Uh, milk powder, uh, but it will still remain within within the target of four to six percent for the rest of the year, as as, far as we see it in the central bank. So that's in, as far as domestic um, as the, the, uh, domestic indicator of stability in the economy is concerned. Inflation seems to be under control. If you look at uh, stability from an external perspective, uh, and usually one looks at the current account of the balance of payments and the reserves of the country. 
Last year, again, the current account uh, of the balance of payments slipped out to 2.6% of gross domestic product. Our target was 2.1%. And it slipped out, again, almost entirely due to the weather because of um, increased oil uh, imports uh, as a result of the reduction in hydropower generation and an increase in rice imports. Because in a good year now, we hardly import any, any rice at all. And, uh, but last year, we had to import a significant amount of rice. Uh, and as far as oil imports were concerned, there was an increase in price as well as an increase in volume. This year, uh, with better weather, uh, the central bank is fairly confident that we should hit the 2.1% of GDP target for the current account of the balance of payments. And if, it, if the current account is around 2%, we can finance it on a sustainable basis. It shouldn't add to our uh, debt dynamics. It shouldn't worsen our debt dynamics. The other indicator of external stability in the country is reserves. The reserves are currently about 9 the gross reserves of the country are about 9 billion US dollars. Uh, they were uh, 6 billion at the end of 2016. They increased to 8 billion at the end of 2017. They're 9 billion now. Uh, but uh, in, within a matter of days, there should be about 585 million US dollars which will flow in to the country's external reserves as the final payment of the Hamantata uh, long lease. And in addition, the government has uh, uh, been successful in negotiating a syndicated loan of 1 billion US dollars, uh, which will also flow into the country in two tranches uh, during the rest of the year. So there is 1.5 billion dollars which will flow in through those two sources. And if you take, put, put that, uh, add that to our, our 9 billion that we have now, uh, then you net out some of the payments that are going to have to be made during the course of the year. Uh, the central bank reckons that the reserves will be about, nine gross reserves will be about 9.5 billion US dollars, which is a pretty healthy number as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. Uh, not only have the volume of reserves gone, gone up, but we've been able to improve the quality of reserves because we've been able to pay down about a billion dollars of these short-term swap arrangements, these three-month swap arrangements that um, the government had with, central bank had with commercial banks. So our short-term liabilities have come down by about a billion US dollars last year, and we paid down another 500 million this year at the same time that the volume of reserves were going up. So there's been an improvement both in terms of the volume as well as the quality of reserves uh, in the last couple of years. So as far as, as stability is concerned, we are making some progress. Uh, however, to persist and to uh, consolidate and to build on this uh, uh, progress, it's critical that most of all that the government's fiscal policy remains on track. Of course, the central bank has to have prudent monetary policy uh, and to manage the exchange rate well. But most importantly, the government has to maintain fiscal discipline. If in the run-up to elections, fiscal discipline is lost, then uh, all bets are off because uh, our, ex our debt dynamics are such that we have very little room to maneuver. Um, one of the things that has happened uh, is that we have handed over much of our economic sovereignty to outsiders. We need to have an arrangement with the IMF. The IMF haven't come and imposed an arrangement on us. We need to have an arrangement with the IMF. There are only two countries in the whole of Asia and the Pacific who have an arrangement with the IMF, Sri Lanka and Mongolia. You want to go to the IMF when you mess things up. So we can't blame, we can't blame uh, others or anybody else. <laughs> but uh, it's really the fact that we mismanaged our affairs, which has meant that we've had to go to the IMF. And we need an IMF arrangement and the kind of good housekeeping seal that comes with it to be able to raise the money we need to service the debt that we have borrowed already. Uh, we have an average of about 3.9 billion US dollars that we have to pay every year for the next four years. In a, for, to do that, we have to borrow on average about 2.5 billion US dollars every year 
from international capital markets. So to do that, we need an IMF arrangement. To do that, we, are, we have to protect the rating of the country so that we have access to these international capital markets at reasonable terms at a time when international interest rates are going up. And so really, we have very little room to maneuver. Uh, if we lose fiscal discipline, and we lose the IMF program, and we get downgraded by the rating agencies, we will not be able to borrow the money we need to repay the money we have already borrowed, and that would lead to a, the kind of scenario that countries in the Asian crisis, Greece, etc., have experienced. Now, if we are able to ma maintain fiscal discipline, my colleagues, who are, we have some excellent people in the central bank, are very confident they can manage them. Discipline is maintained, we are very, very confident that we can manage things so that the economy does not spill over into crisis. It's a manageable problem, but for it to be managed, discipline has to be maintained. So that's the story on, on uh, uh, the current kind of uh, uh, stabilization outcomes. But let me say a little bit about what is being done to um, in place frameworks and to institutionalize macroeconomic policy making so that we have greater resilience and continuity as far as sound macroeconomic policies are concerned. So the government is on a revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation program. It's done well, it's increased revenue, it has contained the budget deficit, it's remained broadly on track. I think the government needs to be given a great deal of credit for the very tough reforms that it has undertaken in terms of revenue enhancement. The VAT, the increase in the VAT rate, and the uh, removal of some exemptions as far as VAT is concerned, as well as the introduction of the new Inland Revenue Act, uh, which has uh, sought to simplify the tax structure and to widen the base. Uh, I know that the, the, the new tax uh, the structure is not very popular, probably among many of you in this room. But you know, uh, the interesting thing in Sri Lanka is that we want Scandinavian type social welfare, but we want to pay Hong Kong rates of tax. Sadly, that doesn't add up. If we want to continue with our free education and free health, we have to pay taxes. We don't pay taxes. Uh, you know, it, it's quite appalling. Uh, the the rate at which taxes are paid in this country. We have one of the most regressive and unfair tax systems in the world. We, can, we, can, we collect 83% of our tax revenue through indirect taxes. When it comes to indirect taxes, the richest person in Sri Lanka and the poorest person in Sri Lanka pays the same rate. That cannot be right. Because the basic principle of any tax system is fairness and the capacity to pay. So we have to move towards greater collection from direct taxes. We need to move from 8317 to something like 6040. So that means that people have to pay more direct taxes and to have a fairer system. And, and the new Indian Revenue Act tries to move in that direction. So the government has taken some tough measures and it's, it needs to be given credit for it. And the fiscal consolidation is going in the right direction, but it needs to be maintained. And in order to institutionalize the improvements that have been made, certainly from the central bank, we are advocating to the government that they, they strengthen the fiscal rules in the country. Sri Lanka has a Fiscal Management Responsibility Act, but it has no teeth. It has, tar it has a target for the, for the budget deficit, it has target for debt to GDP. Uh, it was introduced in 2002, but in most years, the targets have been breached. So what we are advocating, and we hope the government will accept, is to have greater teeth whereby there are very specific reasons for which the targets can be breached. Like, say, relief that has to be paid after a natural disaster. Or if there's a massive exogenous shock, say an oil price, through oil prices or some other uh, movement in international prices, uh, which then results in a deep recession in Sri Lanka, and one has to have robust counter-cyclical fiscal policies. I think the government has to pump money into the system to overcome the deep recession. So in such instances, then there will be provision to reach the target. And even when that happens, 
there would have to be a very specified path of getting back on track. So those are the kind of rules that we are trying to persuade the government to, to adopt so that the improvements that are being made in terms of fiscal consolidation are institutionalized. One thing I should have also mentioned is uh, through adoption of technology, the revenue uh, administration management information system, uh, the tax administration is also improving. There is some way to go, there is quite a long way to go, but it is improving. So that's what's happening on the fiscal side, on the which is of course the government's responsibility. As far as the central bank is concerned and monetary policy, we are in the midst of transitioning to a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, what that does is we, uh, we, earlier we were targeting what we call monetary aggregates, uh, money supply, certain target for the money supply in the country. But now what we're going to target is inflation. Um, and we say, okay, our target is 4 to 6 percent, and we will set monetary policy to achieve that target. So it will be much more proactive, forward-looking. The modeling and forecasting capacity of the central bank has been improved. And we are also putting in place legal and accountability frameworks, which are necessary for a flexible inflation targeting regime. And the cabinet has approved the amendments to the Monetary Law Act, which will enable the flexible inflation targeting regime to be put into place. And as part of that, there are kind of legal and accountability frameworks, which will give the central bank more independence. But in return for more independence, there will also be more accountability. In, in the extreme cases, the accountability uh, as part of a flexible inflation targeting regime involves the central bank governor resigning if the target is missed. Uh, I think New Zealand had it. I don't know if they still have it. Uh, but I'm not quite sure whether my colleagues are going to recommend that. But, but if they do, I think it's a pretty good idea. I think that uh, that's impose, imposed discipline. So that's the framework for monetary policy. For the exchange rate, uh, we are putting in place uh, a, a flexible management of the exchange rate. Uh, in, you know, in the past, we've tried to defend the fixed rate and depleted a lot of our scarce external reserves to do so. That actually is a, is a really a lose-lose situation. For instance, in 2011-12, we spent almost three billion US dollars to defend the rate. Couldn't do it, in the end depreciated by almost 15%. In 2015, under this government, all governments make this mistake, we spent over a billion US dollars. Then in the end, we had to uh, depreciate by almost 10%. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer that you have to avoid it. So we are trying now to have a flexible exchange rate, but, but the central bank is bound to avoid too much volatility and to make sure that the exchange rate reflects underlying fundamentals. You may have uh, read in the papers recently that I was complaining that people are uh, uh, speculating too much with the, with, the, with, the, with the rupee. It's quite possible that they are. Uh, because if you look at uh, the real effective exchange rate of, I, mean, uh, I won't go into details, but we think the rate of the rupee even is fair value. And we also have a healthy level of reserves. So in these circumstances, the rate of depreciation has been more than warranted in our view. Of course, all most emerging market currencies are under pressure because the US dollar is very strong, oil prices are high, and interest rates in the US are going up. For these reasons, there is pressure on a number of currencies. But we feel the rate at which the rupee has been depreciating or the pressure to depreciate the rupee has been unwarranted. Now, the reason why, um, I mean, it's, it's crucial that we give a competitive exchange rate. Because for many years, by having an overvalued exchange rate, we've subsidized foreign producers at the expense of domestic producers. If you have an overvalued exchange rate, exporters uh, have to run, say, if it's 10% overvalued, you're basically asking the exporters to run 110 meters in a 100 meter race. Because their prices, they're not getting full value for their product. Equally, import compete, we have a subsidy to imports with an uh, uh, overvalued exchange rate. And so, therefore, uh, 
people who are producing import computing goods are at a disadvantage. So domestic producers are at a disadvantage. Why governments like overvalued exchange rate is because it actually subsidizes consumers. Now, that is good politically, and you can understand it. But if you keep disincentivizing, if you keep penalizing your producers, at some point you don't have the money to import. And that's what happens to us every so often. We have a balance of payments crisis because one of the reasons is because we don't manage the exchange rate so that we have a competitive exchange rate which benefits our exporters and producers of import computing goods. We are keen to do that, but there is no cause to let the rupee depreciate more than it needs to because then you are imposing higher costs on the people than is warranted. An overly depreciated currency feeds through into un un unnecessary and unwarranted inflation. So which is why we are trying to keep the rate at a point where it's competitive, but it does not get to the point where it gets too depreciated and adds to costs in an unwarranted way. So that's really, uh, those are three frameworks. The fourth framework relates to liability management. Our debt to GDP is 77%. Now, the, again, there's a debate. Auditor General has another number, but it, the way the central bank uh, uh, counts the, 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 the debt of the central government, uh, we exclude state owned enterprises. If you look at the central government debt, it's 77% of GDP. And the median for countries with a comparable rating, our rating peers, the median for them is 55. We are 77. So we are very much an outlier. Uh, and so we really have to manage our debt uh, uh, very carefully. Uh, and in order to enhance the capability of the central bank to manage debt, the Active Liability Management Act has just been passed in Parliament in April. And what it does is enables us now to borrow a bit more for liability management. Before the Act, the government could only borrow its requirement for any given year. The borrowing requirement for any given year constituted the ceiling for what you could borrow. But now what the Active Liability Management Act does is it, under very prescriptive terms, it enables additional money to be borrowed to manage the liability that is coming up ahead of us. So we can borrow some money create a buffer and then use it to go into the market to buy some of our debt and then push out the tenor. Say for debt due in 2019 we can buy some of it and, and for a 10 year tenor and then we push out the maturity of that debt 10 years further. So there is this bunching we have in 2019 uh, onwards and we can address that bunching by using the additional headroom and flexibility provided by the uh, Active Liability Management Act to manage the external debt. And as I said, we are confident we can do that, provided uh, discipline is maintained in the system. So these are the kind of four frameworks that have been put in place to ensure that macroeconomic fundamentals are stable. Then we go, if I may quickly talk about the growth framework. Growth last year was just 3.1%. Part, part of the reason was uh, uh, the weather, clearly. Uh, agriculture has negative growth. That also has some spin-off effects in other sectors. Um, but I think it's fair, at this year, uh, given fair weather uh, and the strong base effects of low growth last year, we should get up to about 5%. Uh, but even that is inadequate, so more needs to be done to strengthen the growth framework. And the government's 2025, Vision 2025 document, sets out how they plan to do that. So there are various measures that are related to the factor markets. That's the land market, the labor market, uh, capital markets. There are a lot of measures which have been set out there to improve the functioning of those markets. Uh, the government is taking measures to improve the investment climate. Uh, there's a one-stop shop 
which hopefully is now going to be much more effective than in the past in the Board of Investment. The Board of Investment's promotion program is going to be much more focused. They work with the Center for International Development at Harvard to identify some priority subsectors to target, and within that, some anchor investors to target. For instance, in Vietnam, Samsung accounted for 40% of their exports when their export transformation uh, took place. Uh, so if you can identify certain sectors, get some anchor investors in, you can have rapid export transformation, and that is what the Board of Investment is now trying to do. And on uh, uh, trade facilitation, there's going to be a, very soon a single electronic window in customs uh, will be fully functional. And the Department of Commerce has opened up a trade portal to address the information as asymmetry that exists in terms of market intelligence for exports. Uh, the Export Development Board has a, a national export strategy which has identified six focus areas and four areas where they're going to provide support, supporting services. So all this has been now mapped out. Uh, and perhaps, potentially, the most transformative measures relate to trade policy. Most controversial, also potentially the most uh, transformative. Um, what has happened in terms of trade policy? First, the government has put in place a legislative architecture which will give domestic producers a degree of protection as some liberalization takes place under the new trade agreements which are being negotiated if they are successfully negotiated. One, they have passed the, um, the uh, 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 what do you call it now, I'm having a senior moment, uh, they, they passed the um, anti-dumping and uh, 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 countervailing duty act. Uh, they passed a safeguards provisions act, which means that if there's a sudden surge in imports, then you can you can impose tariffs. Um, and there's also a trade adjustment package to help enterprises which are affected through the liberalization taking place uh, under these trade agreements uh, uh, to, to for those enterprises to get some assistance in terms of training, in terms of capital, etc. So with the anti-dumping legislation, the, the uh, countering duty legislation, the safeguards and the trade adjustment package, and on top of that, Though often it's said that the government has no trade policy, there is actually a trade policy statement. You may want to go into the website of the Ministry of Development Strategies and International Trade. There is a succinct 25 to 30 page document which sets out the country's trade policy. It's actually set out, in my view, pretty well. So there is a trade policy statement and all these other things that have been put in place to create the environment for negotiating these trade agreements. So if I may say a little bit about these trade agreements, of course, as you know, they've just negotiated an economic partnership agreement with Singapore. Uh, and there, I think the biggest potential, uh, I mean, there's, we can, of course, our exporters will have uh, access to the Singaporean market. And the Singaporean market was always open. You know, 99% of the tariff lines were duty free. So and there's not going to be any big jump in terms of exports to Singapore. But the real potential relates to Singaporean inward investment from Singapore into Sri Lanka because the agreement now gives a more secure framework for Singaporean investors in Sri Lanka. And there's a chapter on e commerce, which again I think uh, offers considerable potential for, uh, for Sri Lankans to, you, uh, to be able to break into the ASEAN market through Singapore as far as e commerce is concerned. So, those are the potential. Then, of course, the, we have a bilateral agreement in both with India, which is being deepened and widened. They want to include services, investment, training, technology, and a similar agreement is being negotiated with China. Now, quite naturally, it's, uh, uh, people get very concerned about a small country like Sri Lanka going into these trade agreements with uh, giant economies like China and India. 
But there are well tried and tested mechanisms whereby small countries can negotiate these agreements and still end up with a win-win situation. And those mechanisms are one. These agreements are negotiated on the basis of non-reciprocity. The larger country does much more than the smaller country. And the second principle is special and differential treatment. What that translates to in practice is that Sri Lanka's negative list in goods would be much longer than China's or India's. Sri Lanka's positive list in services um, will be much shorter than India's or China's. Plus, we also have, will, there will be a strong dispute resolution mechanism which enables the small producers in the smaller country to have access and have recourse to dispute resolution within the uh, agreement itself. So given these uh, safeguards that are possible, it is, uh, provided there is effective negotiation, one can benefit from trade agreements with, with, uh, with uh, uh, India and China. And actually the experience with NAFTA is very instructive. Mr. Trump is very, very upset because the country that benefited more from NAFTA was actually Mexico. So it shows that in, a, in, a, in these trade agreements, a smaller country, a less powerful economy, can actually benefit significantly. Uh, so the, 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 those trade policy agreements, I think, are potentially uh, a major positive because if we are able to complete negotiations with China successfully and deepen and widen the Indian agreement, Sri Lanka would be the only country in the world which has preferential access to China, India, and Europe under GSP Plus. No other country in the world has preferential access to those three enormous markets. So in a, in a world where there are 190 countries all chasing foreign direct investment, this is a key differentiator. We can show the access to these large markets and we couple that with our location. 20 miles from the fastest growing large economy in India, slap bang in the middle of China's uh, maritime circle, access to the Middle East and East Africa, equidistant from Europe and the Far East. You bring our location together with preferential access to a market of over 3 billion people. Clearly, if we get our investment climate right, if we get our trading env environment right, there is tremendous potential in terms of attracting investment into this country. So those are the measures that have been taken to strengthen the growth framework. And there are these mega development projects the government is trying to drive through. Uh, there's the uh, Megapolis project, the Port City project, uh, the Kambantoda project, a Trinkham master plan for the development of Trincomalee, which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, India, Japan, and Singapore are working on jointly a master plan for the development of candy, which Japan is doing. Uh, um, there are uh, uh, industrial zones in Bindiria and Kalutara. Uh, so all this stuff is kind of in the melting pot. And I'd like to say a word about Ambantola, because that again is a, has been a controversial thing. It's important not to see the Ambantola port long lease as just a port project. Because Coupled with that long lease, the Chinese have plans to build what they call five foundational industries. Uh, that is a, uh, an LNG plant, a refinery, a ship repair facility, a steam billet factory, and I don't know what the fifth is, but anyway, uh, there are five big foundational uh, industries they're setting up, which really do then create the supplies for the build out of a very large industrial zone. They have asked for 15,000 acres. I don't know whether we can do that. But even if half or a third of that is done, uh, I think that would be a transformative impact. Now, it's 70 years since we had independence. We've done very little for the people of Bongrani. We've done very little for the people of Uber. The people of Hambantara have some assets, but right now they're not working for them. So this, the, the leasing of the port, 
a catalyze development of a lagging region in the country, which after all was part of the heartlands of the two JVP insurrections. So having not done anything for 70 years for these people, I don't think we should stand in the way of the tremendous potential that the long lease uh, of the Hamanta report generates for development of this lagging region in the country. So that's uh, pretty much all I want to say about, uh, uh, you know, as uh, holding my position, I've got to say why uh, the economy is going to be stable, uh, why the growth framework is uh, getting stronger, why there are projects uh, that can transform the prospects of the country. I should also mention, in terms of short-term uh, short boost to growth, the government, I think next week, will announce this next week or the week after. They're having a program called Ground Pavilion, which will have uh, minor tank uh, rehabilitation, uh, rural roads, rural pullers, uh, markets, agricultural supply chain as the focus for the investment uh, of a planned investment of 80 billion rupees over the next two years. In addition, as part of Enterprise Sri Lanka, another initiative, uh, the state banks and the central bank have about 100 uh, credit schemes which they operate. So those are going to be consolidated into a dozen or 15 and they're going to be rolled out in a much more coordinated and effective way in terms of supporting agriculture and SMEs. So those are two initiatives that are going to be launched within the next couple of weeks to give a short term boost uh, to the economy. So now that's all the stuff about the economy. Let me now get to what I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> Three quarters of the way into the time. Um, the the OBOR um, is it an opportunity. Now I think when one talks about Sino Lanka relations, uh, if one goes back, uh, you know, the, the, the initial contacts go back several millennia. Uh, Farsian was here. Uh, the Admiral of Tse was here. Uh, so there are various links that go back, and there are religious, cultural uh, uh, links as well. Uh, but in modern times, uh, from 1950 onwards, uh, after the People's Republic emerged, uh, the rubber ice path was clearly in 1950 to a, a, a significant landmark. Clearly, Sri Lanka, which was uh, a newly independent country, uh, was able to resist pressure uh, which was uh, imposed on it and uh, to go ahead and sign this agreement with China. And the Chinese have not forgotten that. Uh, and it is fair to say that since that time, China has been a very steadfast uh, friend of Sri Lanka. Through good times and bad times, uh, the Chinese have supported Sri Lanka. Um, then, so that's the, the kind of history of the bilateral relationship. Uh, what, the, what is the rationale for the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, and what are some of its key features? Um, what it's, I think, fair to liken, I think I read an article by uh, Dr. Warden uh, and he pointed this out. Um, it's not dissimilar to the Marshall Plan uh, that the U.S. Uh, implemented in the wake of the Second World War. Uh, the, the U.S. reconstructed Europe uh, or played a major role in reconstructing Europe and, uh, and Japan. Uh, and uh, the American capital that was deployed uh, made, I think, played a significant role in um, crystallizing uh, American preeminence as a global economic and political power. Uh, I suspect the Chinese vision for the One Belt, One Road initiative is not dissimilar. The Chinese have over three trillion US dollars worth of reserves. Uh, and they need to find a way of deploying it. A lot of it was deployed in US treasuries, and a lot of it will continue to be deployed in US treasuries, uh, which actually creates a mutual uh, interdependence, which I think is good for the world, uh, because one hopes that it means that things don't tip over. Uh, but also, uh, they are looking for ways and means of deploying this capital 
uh, in a way that uh, clearly uh, establishes uh, their position in the world uh, as a, an emerging power. Uh, and the, the initiative uh, envisages the linking up of Asia, Europe, and Africa. And there are the two branches to it: the land branch, which goes through Central Asia through to through to uh, Europe, uh, and the maritime Silk Road, which comes through past Sri Lanka through to uh, Africa and Europe again. So. We are fortunate that we are slap back in the middle of the maritime circle. Uh, before I go into the implications for Sri Lanka, let me say a little bit about the, uh, about the characteristics of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, it has five priorities. One is policy coordination through intergovernmental cooperation on macro policies. Two is connectivity, which is linking up these countries on these two uh, uh, pathways uh, through the development of physical infrastructure that is basically roads, railways, uh, uh, ports, etc. Uh, so all that is going on and already a tremendous amount has been done in terms of the Pakistan-China economic corridor. Uh, there has been investment in infrastructure in Belarus and Kazakhstan. So a considerable amount has already been done in terms of physical connectivity. That's the second priority. Third priority is unimpeded trade. Uh, and here, uh, the Chinese uh, are putting in place or have been part of initiatives. Uh, one is the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which was being put together uh, as a, as a uh, in parallel with the uh, Trans-Pacific a partnership, uh, but of course the former had China very much as a part of it, and then the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So these are institutional architectures China has put in place for for trade and investment cooperation. So unimpeded trade and investment is a third a third pillar, and a fourth pillar is financial integration. And here, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank with the Chinese initiative. It has a capital of 100 billion, 100 billion US dollars. Uh, 61 countries have become members. Uh, and the BRICS Development Bank is another uh, financial institution they've created in terms of uh, furthering financial integration uh, across the two, uh, the belt and the road. And also we are seeing the internationalization of the yuan. The yuan is now a part of the SDR basket of the, uh, of the IMF. Uh, the other currencies were the US dollar, the yen, the euro, and the stone. So this is now the fifth uh, currency in the SDR basket, which has been a major advance in terms of internationalizing the yuan. And the fifth pillar is people to people contacts. Uh, the, the, the training, academic contacts, uh, tourism, uh, Chinese tourism is booming. Uh, so these are the various, the five priorities that underpin the One Belt, One Road uh, 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 initiative. So um, what are some of the uh, concerns that exist? about the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, certainly uh, the US uh, and parts of the West have had concerns uh, that the Chinese are using uh, their capital uh, to basically uh, entice the countries into a debt trap, uh, which would then result uh, in the Chinese having undue influence over the affairs of those countries. Uh, they also think that some of the infrastructure that is being built is strategic rather than uh, commercial, uh, particularly the ports that are being uh, built uh, in, in uh, uh, South Asia. Uh, I must say an anecdote uh, which makes me 
somewhat skepticism about Robert Kaplan's uh, string of pearls is the fact that the Chinese were the third choice for the Haman for the Court. It's not something they jumped and did. It was offered to India and Japan uh, before China agreed. And uh, I know the minister who actually negotiated with the Chinese to get them to do it. And he said it was extremely hard work. Uh, they had to sell it as, as a project in President Rajapaksa's constituency. And, you know, they were not at all keen. Having said that, this was, of course, some years ago. And President Xi's China is very different from the China of his predecessors. President Xi's uh, China is more trusting. Uh, and, and so it's possible that uh, their approach may be different. But it is a fact that China didn't look for and jump into Hamantota with great relish. They had to be dragged into Hamantota uh, by us. Uh, so at least there is some ground for believing that this isn't the grand design in terms of uh, getting a strategic foothold uh, in Sri Lanka. And my own perception is that uh, uh, India has significant naval capability in the Indian Ocean. The U.S. has Diego Garcia. The Chinese foreign policy historically has been very cautious and circumspect. It's very difficult to believe that the Chinese will be adventurous and cavalier in terms of their intrusion into the Indian Ocean. They will, of course, take advantage of any commercial opportunity, uh, but there is, I don't think, they will uh, be adventurous. It will be interesting to hear what Dr. Gohane has to say about that. Um, the also, I think, the Indians uh, have clearly have concerns about the increasing footprint uh, that China has uh, in, in South Asia, uh, and uh, they are working with Japan and Australia uh, in terms of uh, creating a strategic partnership. Uh, they have strengthened their capabilities in the uh, Nicoma and the Andaman Islands. Uh, so they've also taken certain measures. But as far as, uh, it's, it's encouraging. I know the Indo, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Indo, uh, my wife is pointing back to the watch. The Indo, uh, uh, Sino Indian relations have had their ups and downs. But it's encouraging that the latest phase seems to demonstrate some toying of that relationship after the standoffs we've had um, and the problems have, been resolved, have not been resolved. But it's encouraging that again there seems to be better contact because really as far as South Asia is concerned, the better Sino-Indian relations are, the greater the room for maneuver that the country, the smaller countries in South Asia have um, to benefit from the One Belt, One Road initiative. If the Indo-Sri Lanka, Indo-Sino relations are good, then India feels relatively secure about China's role. That opens up more opportunities for us. Because the, we cannot ignore geographical realities. Um, uh, Mr. Menon, who was High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, then Foreign Secretary, and then National Security Advisor, an extremely moderate man, an extremely balanced and nuanced thinker, in his book, talks of Sri Lanka being like an aircraft carrier 20 miles off the coast of India. So that is the perception that the Indians have, and that is a reality that we have to accept. So our uh, foreign policy, our strategic choices, uh, our economic choices can't ignore that. It doesn't mean that we, it, our choices are very narrowly circumscribed, because if we are uh, astute in the way we conduct our uh, uh, diplomacy, we can create space for us to do quite a lot, despite this geographical reality. Um, what are some of the other advantages? Um, uh, clearly, it's capital. I mean, China is deploying capital, but it's important that it is equity rather than debt. Uh, and we're seeing a pivot from debt to equity now. Uh, Hamantota is equity, Port City is equity, the uh, CICT terminal in, in, in Colombo Port is equity. So that is the direction we need to go, but we certainly can't take on too much external debt. So with the advantages in terms of uh, equity flows, 
uh, foreign direct investment into Sri Lanka. And of course, that can help with the export transformation that is critical for us if we are to repay our debt and get on a uh, trajectory of accelerated growth and employment generation. Also, I think, if I'm, uh, one other point is the Sino, uh, in, uh, Sino Sri Lankan uh, free trade agreement. Uh, it will give us capital, it can give us access to markets, but more than anything, it can give us access to know how. Professor Ricardo Hausman was here recently and emphasized the importance of know how and how uh, FDI can be a very important vehicle through which you gain know how. If you look at the progress that the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia made, their capacity to adopt and adapt technology is critical in their economic transformation. We have not done at all well at that. And one of the reasons why they've done better is because they have been able to be much more successful than we have been in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. So let me now wind up, I've gone way too long. Uh, one is economy stabilizing. Two, there are plans to strengthen the growth framework, but those plans have to be implemented more effectively, more quickly. They're going far too slowly so far. And as I said, on balance, the One Belt, One Road Initiative offers tremendous opportunities for Sri Lanka, but we need to manage our diplomacy uh, carefully to ensure that we are able to uh, secure the maximum possible gains. Thank you all very much and I'm sorry I've exceeded my time so much.